Hello again, and welcome to another SMB Community Podcast. This is Carl, and I'm joined today by somebody I've known his entire life, my <laughs> brother Manuel. <laughs> welcome, sir. Thanks. Thanks for having me on again. <laughs> so, uh, so, obviously, people don't know all of our background, but Manuel has been in technology for almost ever, the 1980s, I think. You went to tech school in Spokane and then, uh, you know, eventually came to work for me probably 10 years ago now, more than that. No, it doesn't, yeah. And uh, then went off on his own and has helped several other companies figure out managed services, figure out how to, to implement uh, policies that will make them profitable. And so now he does a bunch of coaching and he has written some books and why don't you tell us your side of the story? <laughs> well, same as you, right? You know, when we grew up, when we were kids, we, we actually been in service delivery for, you know, since we were in, you know, the first decade of our lives, we've been in service delivery. So, and then um, I got interested in electronics and, and uh, I thought I was going to get, go to college and get, get a degree in automation and robotics. But um, computers were so hot that I literally got stolen away. The first job I had was actually out of tech school. I had a four-year degree in automation. Um, my first job was working, was um, programming the BIOS chips on motherboards in the late 80s. And um, I had been doing computer work on the side during tech school, making money hand over fist, fixing stuff for people. And so every time I tried to get into the electronic side of things, I kept getting lured away by the money. <laughs> and it was also interesting because of the networking and the computers. And so I ended up spending, you know, after I spent up, I, I would say I spent a third of my adult life in computers related to robotics and automation. And then the other two thirds was all computers and networking. But all along the way, I've been collecting, you know, in, how to run a business and how to run a managed service, you know, business specifically. And over the years become an expert at process control. And so that's why when, when, you know, after so many years in the IT industry, I went, wait a minute, I want to go help other people do what they're doing. And as you know, I've, um, caught, I've got a trademark on the name getting to the next level because it's the name of my book. And that's the, you know, the, the heart of my coaching program is basically that's what I want to do is help people get to the next level. So right. it, right. right. we superimpose a picture of your book, you know, right about here. So, <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know where that is. <laughs> so, so, um, so uh, a lot of people don't know this. So you lived in Sacramento, California for a while and worked for me, eventually became president of the company and then wandered off to, I, I guess I interrupted your trip to Florida for whatever it was, five or six years. <laughs> then you, you finished your trip and ended up in Florida. So, now you're in Boca, and the weather is perfect all the time, and, right? Life is good? Yeah, yeah, it, it doesn't suck any. So <laughs> I was originally headed for just for warmer waters, like in San Diego. I thought I was headed for San Diego. And then, like you say, I was there for six years in Sacramento, and going down and visiting and diving and sailing, is sailing in the San Francisco Bay and diving in San, um, 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 south of there, um, where's the aquarium? Uh Half Moon Bay and places like that. I realized the water's too cold, so that's when I decided Florida was more more for me because the water's it's warm and the water's warm. Right. So, so here's the question: Now that you've been in Florida for several years, do you actually go scuba diving all the time? I I, I go more often than I did. I don't go often as often as I'd like, um, but I but I certainly go. I certainly go. Well, I don't get as much sailing in. That, that I've been having trouble with. I keep, I got some little boats. I had a catamaran and I had a, um, I had a little um, two person, you know, trailer or boat. It's time to get a, I'm saving up for the big one. You need a big boat. So one of the things that you do really well that a lot of people don't know because of the way you do it is work life balance. And you basically disappear and kind of have, I guess, this same approach to me sometimes that. Some, if you just disappear for a day or two, nobody will notice. And it yeah. turns out to be true. <laughs> yeah. 
you just go off the radar and, uh, you know. So I, I applaud you for that. Not enough okay. people do that. I'm trying to make it easy, I'll tell you. That's, you know, that's her. And, and I think it's, I got to tell you, you know, the sooner you figure out that that's important, the better. Because I think it makes my work better. I get, I find I get excited to like, I want to hurry back from whatever it is I'm doing and get back to building and working on the thing. And I don't think that you, I think that you can lose the love for what you do because you do it. You know, there's one thing to be dedicated nose to the grindstone and try to get something done. But at some point there's gotta be a let up where you go do some other thing and you remember why you have such a passion for this thing. And that's what right. keeps it going. And I think that yeah. that's an important it's element. So interesting. One of the things I do when I hire technicians is I have them, write a paragraph or two in response to a Craigslist ad, and they can't send in a resume until they send in a couple of paragraphs. And if they send in a resume, I just delete their application. But I want to get those paragraphs, and I've taken to asking the question, send me one or two paragraphs about why you're passionate about technology. And it, it eliminates people from consideration because they literally just they will not write those paragraphs. And I think it's because a lot of people are no longer passionate about technology. They're no longer passionate about this. They got into this business and then they realized it's a pain in the neck and it's hard and you have to deal with people. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think also it's so hard that they've lost the love for it. Yeah. Or they, or they don't genuinely have it. Yeah. Maybe they never did. Yeah. You know, they said, this is just a job. My mom said I should get a, a good degree. And so, that's what, you know, or, a diploma or whatever else it is. Right. So let's talk about your business for a minute. So what exactly is your current business model? Is it primarily coaching? Um, so right now my current business model is that it is primarily coaching because most people I think need to get some idea where they're going and what they're doing. And so I, because I have a, I have something different than everyone else. I have a very specific coaching system. It's not just a method between the, the book that I wrote called getting to the next level where I talk about um, defining your business and the tools that you need. And, and I talk about my methodology, but I also have a project portal. It's a a business strategy collaboration portal. It's a tool I actually use to apply an agile methodology to your business strategy to help you figure out what your strategy looks like and then execute on it. And, and, Layered, you could say, on top of that is deep dive strategy help where you say, okay, um, we really need help getting the business moving in the right direction, but we don't, we need some real hands on. We don't really have any idea what direction we're going. And so I do that as kind of like a, an add on service. And then I also will take on projects. So most of my engagements are about people who need one-on-one -on -one help or help with their team either very specifically for process or for their business strategy or some combination and and that's the bulk of what I do but it always ends up leading to okay so now that we've gotten figured out where we're going and what we're doing Manny we need help this with this thing and then that's when we step it up and go to the next level of engagement and either treat it as a project or or just or just yeah. teaching them how to cultivate their own strategy as a competency is also uh, you know, else. it's interesting when I coach people, they usually come to me with this very amorphous request. Uh, everything is broken. Everything doesn't work. We don't have any processes. And it's like, I'm sorry, you, 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 you have to prioritize what you want to work on. And I can't, I can't fix everything, certainly not in one day. And uh, I, in fact, I can't fix anything at all. You have to fix it. But you know what I mean? That do you also find this that people come to you and you have to help them narrow it down and say, this is the problem. Yeah, that's in fact, it's the whole reason I developed my methodology. You know, again, I, I've made the comment about agile, but I, I've kind of endeared to agile for a particular reason. The like previously a company would say they, they go into business and they say, this is what we're going to go do. We're going to go sell widgets and they start selling widgets and they start figuring out their processes and all these other things. And along with the development and the maturity of the organization, they have all these complex issues that come up around sales and finance and marketing and different aspects. And like you say, it's just this nebulous blob that just keeps growing. And when they're standing there, they go, this is, I'm sure this is what we need to do to fix. And what you and I do is go, 
Well, we're going to kind of tap into our understanding of how business is run and how you got to where you are, but we have to show it to them. And what we end up doing is dismantling it and saying, okay, here are the pieces. And you know what? That's working okay. That's working okay. That's working okay. This is really where the problem is. So you might think that you just need help with sales, but what you need help with is staffing or process or whatever else. And so for me, you know, the short answer is yes. They come, they, they have this nebulous blob that is their business. They think they know what's wrong with it, but I kind of convince them, let's take a look at this and see what's really wrong with it. Because you could be putting all your time and energy towards something that's not going to change your, they're not going to change just significantly your bottom line revenue, your cash flow or anything. And and then when they, when they see that, when we take the machine apart, they can see the broken parts too, you know, but they don't, not everybody knows how to take that apart. And I think that's the right. thing, one of the things that we do as business coaches. That, well, it's also the case people look at their pain and they say, well, I, you know, today I'm having a problem with hiring. And then the next day it's today I'm having a problem with collections. <laughs> the next day is today I'm having a problem with getting my technicians to put their time in the system. And so every day it's a, it's a different thing. And so they have to figure out what's first and what's second. Yep. Yep. So, Take it harder. Yeah. So you mentioned agile several times. Why don't you define that for folks in, in relation to running a managed service business? So first off, I'll kind of say agile is this thing that the best part is nobody owns agile. But when I say agile, most people think of software development and the methodology they use to develop software. They may not know what it is, but in a nutshell, agile is the ability to move away from a standard waterfall project method where you say, we're going to build a, a skyscraper. And so we're going to go build a foundation and then we're going to build, you know, the, the framework and the cement and all of the parts and everything that come along with it move along a very steady line and everything in front of it relies on everything behind it. But with agile, because we're not building a skyscraper, we can take and say, look, I'm going to look at the different aspects of my business or a piece of software. It's interface, the front end, the, the features, the functionality. And, I can say there are things that we need to change about it, things we need to make better about it, things we need to implement. And we create this laundry list, for example, like your cell phone, of all the bugs and features we want to add to your cell phone. And the programmers go to work and they say, what can we get done between now and let's say the end of the, the next time we do a software release to fix these bugs and, and add these features? And they call that a little quantum of work. They call it a sprint. And then they go to work on that sprint, the team does, and they get done, and you get an update on your phone that says your phone is now at the next version. It's at version you know, 3.8 or 3.85 or whatever else it is. So Agile is the ability to say, wait a minute, though, midstream, a new bug showed up. We've got to put it in. Well, if we do, we won't have time to finish that feature. So which is more important? And they get to dynamically decide what the most important things to do for the client are for that software, for the phone for the features and the bugs. And they can make a change on a, on a moment's notice. Whereas when you're building a skyscraper, you can't do any of that. Well, so when you apply it to business, we look at your business as a laundry list of issues like we talked about. I got a problem with, you know, people are putting their time in, sales people aren't following up. All the way through sales, marketing, finance, this laundry list of things. And then when I look at the client and I say, well, there's only three of you, or there's 20 of you. If you have a big company, or a small company, each of the departments in the company or you as a small company, go grab off of that laundry list of things. What are the most important things we can do to change the course of our business and the finance and the cash flow or, or whatever in this business quarter? Like by the end of the business quarter, what could we do that is most important? They pick those items and may make their little sprint. They execute on it and they find their business has gotten to the next level just incrementally. and then. They repeat that every business quarter. They go say, okay. And the cool part is if they're focusing on this little sprint, this mini laundry list, if something changes, they can be dynamic about it and say, well, even though we set out our business strategy as a long two-year thing, as we're executing on it, we have a development that needs to be paid attention to. They can, they can change the focus and add it to the sprint, kick something else out maybe, and focus on it. And it means that a business can be much more dynamic in their cultivation of their strategy and the execution of their strategy than, than any other method you could think of, right? Or, or any time before. Right. And I think, so, I think it's relevant because of how businesses operate today. Some businesses are only in existence for five years. 
<laughs> Unfortunately, that's true. No, but I mean, as a design, if you think about like uh, one of the most recent companies that got bought, what's going to be the roadmap for Autotask, like, for example? Over the next five years, that, that holding company wants them to make money. They're going to come up with a roadmap that's about money. And the company's going to come up with a roadmap that's about product, uh, work, um, value to the customer. And they're going to have to execute on it in a very short amount of time. And they're going to have to be very dynamic to meet both those needs. And, I th and the old style of business strategy, that wouldn't get it. Right. So, you know, it's interesting because I think – a lot of people in this business are becoming more professional, right? Everything across the board is becoming more professional. At the same time, there's newbies coming in all the time that they, they don't understand the term managed services. They, they might have seen it, but they don't, you know, other than a forum on Reddit or something, it doesn't make any sense to them because, you know, that there's no reason that you would say, I'm a computer consultant and then know that managed services or SMB technology exists or anything like that. Um, so there's kind of this constant, you know, people coming in on one side and on the other side, people are becoming more and more professional and using better tools on the other side. Um, and in the middle of all that, we had this mergers and acquisitions, like frenzy going on. Um, right. Do you think that helps or hurts companies in the long run to have, to be surrounded by mergers and acquisitions? Well, so first off, I believe that mergers and acquisitions is a, it, although it's become a, the best way to build a company fast. I think that, and don't forget that it stems from the distribution and consolidation of money and, and, and work. Just like in the, like in the stock market, you see money distri uh, being distributed as the market's going up. And then as the market starts to go down, it gets consolidated. Well, right now companies are, you saw when the economic downturn was coming along, they were getting bought up, being consolidated like crazy. Now they're popping up like crazy and they can't be conglomerated as fast. Well, so it's a necessary evil, but I think that it depends on what you're out to do. Because if you're a small company, you say, we have an innovative way of doing things and we want to build a, a, a cache of clients that are really highly profitable and we want to just roll it over and make money, then it's a great thing. But you better be able to execute very well on your strategy over the, the three-year to five-year max period to be able to do that. But if you're a business that's trying to build a substantial client base and build something that's longer lasting than you and your family that might have multiple locations and become a big corporation, I think that it has value for you in adding companies to your, your, to your mass. But I think it, I would say it's better advantage to a company that's watching from the sidelines because everybody that's in that merger or acquisition status is closer to chaos than you are. <laughs> so I guess it comes down is if I were, I think it's not good because it, it, it leads companies to believe that it can grow themselves faster than they really can artificially because most of them don't know what is involved. If you're not involved in it, I think it's very good because they're all in chaos while you're in order, you know, so. Um, you know, it's interesting. So I was talking to Nigel Moore from Australia uh, in the last podcast, and he was he used this term about a strategic sale. And what he's basically talking about is when he was selling his company, the company that bought his wasn't interested in his client list as much as they were in his processes. Because basically right. they had grown to the point where they'd outgrown yeah. their current processes and they were very they were more of a technical company than a strategic company. So they bought his company to get his processes. And so the value of his company was in the processes, not in the client list. And it's, it's interesting to me because I wonder if some of these mergers and acquisitions are creating large, as you say, chaos factories and don't really have the processes they need to be doing what they're doing. And you know, I, I, in some ways I think it's an opportunity for smaller IT consultants to say, look, those guys are, they're too big. They're now have a hundred technicians. They are in six states. They can't do this as well as we can. And I think that's absolutely true. So that, that's why I say it's really, a, it's really a hard question is, it depends on where you're standing. And, and, and I will say, so the last company that I ever collected a, a W2 from, they were bought for the process. And it was interesting because the people that bought that company approached me at one point and said, your name is 
all over these processes and all throughout this. But what we we didn't quite get our hands on everything we thought we were going to get in the process. So they were looking to engage with me about basically helping them with the process because that's what they thought they were getting. They would they said it would be nice to get more clients. It'll be nice to get some more new text, but we want our hands on that process. And it's why, you know, when we put on all the courses we put on, we say document your processes because your processes are what set you free. And, and I agree that um, I think that, like I say, when I see companies getting into mergers and acquisitions that are what somebody I would consider my opponent, I know they are down for the count. They are down and out for six, nine, 12 or more months just trying to get those two companies to meld together they're going to be the most vulnerable and be able to give the worst. They're only going to be able to give the, the lowest level of service capability, regardless of what they think, because most likely they didn't consider, they really have no idea what they're in for, right? They're yeah. literally going to sideline themselves in their ability to leverage high quality service because of what they've done to themselves. And what's interesting is it's, it's at a time when, if they give terrible service and they lose customers, nobody gets blamed for it, right? Because there's so right. much going on. They're like, oh no, that that had to do with the you know the transition, or that had to do with with the the merger, and so everybody's got an out <laughs> for for giving poor service. So yeah. it's, and then what's really yeah, it just did, and then the, and then another one comes along. I was I have a client who. Um, I, and I've seen many mergers, and I got to tell you, 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 I know have have as well. Whatever you think is going to happen is not likely what's going to happen. It, it's so interesting to say at the end of the day. And part of the thing is, I talk about this in my book, Getting to the Next Level. I talk about the culture of a company. You meld two companies together, and everybody in the acquired company has to believe in the vision and the mission of the acquiring company. Otherwise, it's just a job and a paycheck. And if that's if they're in it for anything else, they're all going to disappear because it's kind of like, you know, in the pirate days, you take over somebody else's ship and you say, okay, you can either jump over or you can come on board with us. Well, who who jumps off in the ocean? Do they all come on board? They nod their head. They do whatever they got to until they get their feet on light and dry land, and then they disappear. And but or they really truly realize that that captain and that ship, their voyage, they're really into it, and then they. They adhere to it. They become part of the crew. That is not the most likely opportunity. And most companies, when they go to look at mergers and acquisitions, don't even consider that. They consider the components, the client list, the employee list, the bottom line revenue, and and the processes, and that's it. They don't look at the the melding of the culture, kind of like marrying, you know, two people getting married that to to put a family together. Well, as you know. I'm a huge believer in culture. We worked so hard in my managed service businesses to basically guarantee culture. I mean, our, our interview process involved all of the technicians. Uh, we had we, we went out to lunch with people, and one of the biggest questions was, yeah. how is this fit? And we hired people who were, you know, had a fresh degree. The ink was still wet, but they fit our culture. And as a result, we were able to grow that culture. And, you know, um, I love the the whole concept of, you know, getting the right people on the bus, you know, Jim Collins. And I believe Jim Collins. at the, the uh, height of our success, so we could have literally come into the office and said, we've decided to forget this technology stuff and we're going to build furniture. And we wouldn't have lost any employees. <laughs> because no, I don't think so at all. No. wanted to work together, you know, and so... Yeah. Uh, no, I think it, it took us years to put that together. And I got to tell you, a lot of the, you know, when I started to write my book, the seeds of that, the next company I went to work for, all of that stuff is when you look at this and see, when you see it firsthand, you see the immense power of it because, you know, and it, it it's, it, I think it's one of the most important things. It's why I put it at the top of the pyramid when I started developing a business. And I think it's an impasse for a company that wants to get to the next level that they can, you're only going to get so far without culture and compass because, that's what's going to see you through it. You know, we, like you said, these, some of these companies, that they get to 100 people. If they're not conveying down through the ranks what the vision and the mission are and keeping everybody together, they can be as efficient as they want to as individual disparate teams, but the machine doesn't work because it doesn't, it doesn't 
there are parts missing. We're not sure why we're doing it. We're not sure why sales should care. So well, we don't it's, about sales and it's yeah. like the old joke of you know, there's four guys holding up this piano, and one of them says, "Man, we're never going to get this thing up," and the other guy says, "Oh, I thought we were taking it down." <laughs> you know, it's the same thing, right? <laughs> right. Uh, you know that you can have pieces of your team that are working really hard at cross purposes, and somebody's got to make sure that that doesn't happen. So we're almost out of time. Let me switch gears again and. Talk about your company and how can people, in, what's the best way for them to engage you? Um, I would say the best way is hit my website, look around. It's, you know, uh, it's pretty straightforward. I kind of lay out a lot of what I consider the mindset of, uh, of how I coach, which is, you know, you're going to figure out your roadmap. And I, I have stuff on there to help you kind of get an idea of where your pain points are. And uh, I've even got uh, some really good documentation, you know, on, what, what coaching looks like so that you, if, you, if you've never done it before, you know what you could expect, including how I roll my coaching program. But I also have a um, request for a strategy where you can basically sign up, no cost, no sales, no whatever. I just want, if you want to just talk about your business and your business strategy, I'll spend, I'll spend an hour with you talking about your business strategy and just your pain points and whatever else, um, you know, with no, no sales, no marketing, no, you know, whatever. Uh, anybody that's interested in doing that and um, you can find me at uh, www.manualpalachuk.com. I was going to say, you got to say that so I can type it down below here and give people a link to click on. So, all right. So manualpalachuk.com. Very cool. So what's next for you? Uh, we just finished the first quarter and you got to three fourths of the year left to go. So what, what, what are you up to next? Yeah. I'm, I'm traveling. I think, Almost every month, I think, other than one. I'm going to be in the UK and uh, Europe next month. I'm hoping to uh, I put in a call for papers for a, a thing called the Heart of Agile in Paris. It would be really cool to get a nod and get to talk at the Agile Conference in Paris. Wow. Uh, but I, I will be doing a presentation in the UK for one of my clients um, on business strategy. And then, uh, of course, we're doing Channel Pro together, you and I, if anybody wants to see that. And I keep thinking we got to – somebody made the comment about we should take the – the MSP talk show on the road, and I keep I keep thinking about that. Um, so Which we do just so people know. If you go to any of the Channel Pro events this year, we are doing with uh, uh, Matt from Channel Pro and uh, Rich from Channel Pro a really funny, entertaining, and educational um, skit, I guess. Or anyway, we're we, we're doing some really fun stuff. And if you have not seen the Channel Pro shows, they are truly spectacular, and so we got one coming up in Baltimore, and then uh, I guess we the next one is, is Long Beach, I think. Long Beach in like November, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so and actually, next uh, two weeks from now, I'll be in Las Vegas for HDI, uh, where I'm doing presentations on ten golden rules of PSA and working in real time. And uh, you know, I'm, for for me, it's uh, working on the presentations. I've got my own marketing thing in place, but I also have an endeavor that I want to talk with you about one day. We should do a podcast maybe next month um, on on just the, how I'm taking agile and applying it to the service delivery process, which the seeds of that started when I was working as a service coordinator for you because I was there for six years, you know, and as I had a chance to sit down and watch this machine, I realized that that the agile methodology works in service delivery and it's this thing that's um, it's gaining a lot of ground in the in IT uh, IT companies are realizing that there are some best practices they can adhere to and one of them is this idea of, of agile and I, I you know we could just talk about that for sure for our podcast yeah. next month. versus the uh, the alternative that the some of the PSAs push, which is to stack up all your dominoes an eighth of an inch across and then just right. knock them all down and, and have your schedule be screwed up every day. Like yeah, I call it, I call it the stack and run, agile as opposed to stack and run. And then auto yeah. tasks, I, I, I jokingly refer to them as a lot of tasks and connect wise is connect dominoes, you know, they're, <laughs> but they, there's a better way out there. And it's uh, and that's what I'm moving into is cause it's uh, it helps me further the education component of my processes that I, that I've built over the years, it gives them a name and it gives them a home and it gives them a, you know, a, a package. So that's, that's yeah. what well, and we did use a priority based system rather than a scheduling system in both of those PSAs. And I've certainly used it in everyone that I've 
I've touched since then. Sadly, we're out of time. But okay. as you said, we should do this again. So thank you very much for being with us today. We'll send folks to manualpolichuk.com. And uh, with luck, uh, some folks will engage you. So where are you at right now, by the way? Where in the world is Carl? I, I, I'm in a hotel room in New Orleans. Oh, so the weather's probably pretty nice there. It is. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I don't know why you're in a hotel room then. Because <laughs> <laughs> I scheduled this podcast. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks See you.